Okay, you know that gospel song that started out, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there? Uh, there's a lot of people talking about heaven, and they're not going there. You know, one of the sad things that I see so many times in funerals, and it happened recently, I won't mention who it was, but I go to a funeral, and I hear people talking, especially the loved ones, and oh, they're so much better off, they're, they're in a much better place, they're out of their pain and their suffering and all of this kind of stuff. And I know that the person has had no outward indications of a relationship with Jesus Christ. They've had no church background. Uh, just a, you, you, know, you don't want to be a judge, but it's like some said, you become a fruit inspector and you don't see anything in the lives of the individual that has died or in the lives of those around them that indicate that they are believers. And yet they are assured that their loved one is in heaven. And uh, I'm just thinking, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're not in a better place. But you don't say that to them, obviously. But there is a lot of talk about heaven. People like to talk about heaven and, and talk about going there. They don't want to make preparations for it necessarily, but they want to go there. And uh, tonight we're going to take a look at what the Bible says heaven is like. We have a lot of... Uh, ideas ourselves that we have concocted through the years. Uh, we have in our minds that angels are floating around on clouds with harps and halos and all these kind of uh, preconceived ideas, and they may not be the things that we'll actually see, but John's given us a pretty good vision of what's going on in heaven. So we want to look at that, but let's look at John, uh, Revelation chapter 21, beginning with verse 9, and, and we'll just read uh, maybe the first uh, uh, verses 9 through 13, and, uh, but we'll be looking at the whole chapter uh, tonight. John writes, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. I will stop there just a minute. I like that. that that's one of my favorite uh, phrases in the Bible. I'll show you the bride the lamb's wife. Isn't that neat to know that we're going to be the lamb's wife? I like that. Anyway, he said, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending down from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall and twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates and Names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. There are three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall was of the city, had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Father, this is quite an introduction to what heaven is going to be like, and so we are excited to explore even further the depths and riches of what John saw and tried to explain to us about that wonderful place called heaven. So help us tonight to get in our minds, get in our thoughts, get in our focus what heaven is going to be like and how wonderful it's going to be so that we'll want as many people to join us as we can in that wonderful, glorious place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as we look at this, uh, we remember that last week, we looked at heaven coming down. Let's just rever review for a minute. Last week, heaven came down and glory filled our soul. We saw that over in uh, uh, chapter uh, 21, verses uh, 1 and 2, where heaven came down. And then over here in uh, verse 11, it said, uh, or verse 10, that the holy city was coming down. So that's a reference back and forth to the two. We heard or we saw heaven coming down, and we heard God say, It's done. It's finished. Redemption's plan is done. It's complete. What I started in Genesis 3, now I'm fulfilling. I'm finishing. The judgment, all of it has been done, and Eden is coming back. Uh, the Garden of Eden kind of wonderful uh, event that it was, the wonderful place that it was, is coming back even more magnificent. And to add to all of that, he says, evil is being cast out. 
it's gone. It is no more. In uh, verse 8, he said, The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, adulterers, all liars uh, have their part in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So he said, all of that's behind. So tonight, we want to look at what heaven is like and what God has waiting for us. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful experience, I think. So let's look, first of all, at the general appearance uh, of heaven, uh, g- the general design. And, and we see that uh, in verse 10. He talks about it being divine in origin. This is something that God is making. This isn't anything that man has made. And man has made some pretty awesome things. You've got to admit that. I mean, man is flawed, but he has made some pretty awesome things and buildings, uh, beautiful structures that you see, and you just can't believe uh, the insides of some of these buildings. But this is something that God has done. God did this on His own. And in verse 10, it says that He carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So it has a divine origin coming out of heaven from God. And if we look over in um, Hebrews chapter 11, it says that the builder and the maker of this place is God. So it's no mistake. This is something that God has done. He is the builder and the architect. Now, it's also the eternal throne. Look at verse 11. Having the glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God. Now, the word glory there is doxa, uh, but it's, it's the glory, it's the magnificence of God uh, sitting there on the throne. Just the brilliance, the Shekinah glory, if you please, of God on the throne. And it was a place of radiant beauty. He says, Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, we're going to see jasper mentioned several times in this account. But I want us just to stop for a moment and look at this. It says a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, if you look up in the um, dictionary or online now in, in this modern day and look at jasper stone, it says it is an opaque stone, red, orange, green, sometimes blue, and shined really uh, brightly, but um, not something that you can see through. And it is of lesser quality than a diamond. That's not what's talked about here. Because here he says, it is a precious stone, clear as crystal. The jasper that's talked about here in the Bible, the biblical jasper, is a stone that was clear as crystal. It was like a diamond. That's the only thing. We, if we were doing it today, we'd say it was a diamond when we saw it because it was crystal clear in appearance. Uh, the, so we look at what he's saying, uh, that this is like a jasper stone. Let me uh, show you this picture of a uh, diamond. This is supposedly the largest diamond in the world. It is the Kor Enor diamond and its price is priceless they can't put a price on it because of the uniqueness of the diamond and its brilliance it's part of the uh, crown jewels of britain uh, the uh, british royal crown uh, crown jewels and it is described as the most magnificent gemstone in the world now i looked online and that was the top largest diamond listed the next largest diamond was valued at two billion dollars so if you can imagine and it was substantially smaller than this one what uh, is so if you can imagine a city a wall built out of diamonds that are more priceless and more radiant than that that's going to be something to behold, behold. and the, the walls of the New Jerusalem are going to be just that. He says, made of uh, diamonds. In fact, the whole city is like a, a diamond, uh, like a jasper coming out of the city. Well, let's get a little bit more specific in what he's talking about here in the exterior. 
you always see the exterior of something first, and that kind of overwhelms you, or maybe underwhelms you, depending upon what you're looking at. But you see the outward appearance. So let's see what the outward appearance of uh, heaven is going to be. As we look in here in verse 12, it talks about a great high wall with 12 gates. Now, as we look down here, we find that the walls are made of 12,000 furlongs. They're 12,000 furlongs high. We know that it's a cube. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But just follow with me for a moment. And, and as we go, hopefully we'll explain this. The exterior wall is 1,400 miles high. 1,400 miles high and 216 feet thick. We see that in verses 11 and 12. Um, well, let's look at verse 12. Showed me a great high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels, and the gates were named after each one of them. And he goes on and talks in verse um, uh, 14 and, and following about measuring. In verse 15, he says, he had a measure rod, and he, it was a gold. And he said, measure the city and its gates and its wall. And the city is laid out square, its length and as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furloins. 12,000 furloins would mean 1,400 miles. Now, he says the length, the breadth, and the height are equal. So the height of the wall is 1,400 miles high. The length of the wall is 1,400 miles long. The breadth from one side to the other is 1,400 miles long. Now, you probably are really good at figuring this stuff out, but not, not me. I'm a visual person. I have to have something in reference to that. So I did a little bit of uh, uh, investigation and from Graham, North Carolina to Denver, Colorado is 1,614 miles, 200 miles further than the city of Jerusalem is going to be. So if you can imagine how far away Denver, Colorado is, and just go 200 miles shy of that from Graham to um, Colorado is the length of the wall and the height of the wall and the breadth of the wall. Now, the thickness of the wall is 216 feet. And that's what I was trying to figure out here. But I got a problem. The church isn't helping me out a bit because I thought, surely this is 100 feet, but it's only 50 feet from one wall to the other wall. I need 216. If I go from the, front, from the back of the church all the way up to where the screen is, that's about 80 feet. So I'm still a long way from being 216 feet. But maybe that gives you some kind of idea of the width of these walls to support a wall that's 1,400 miles high. And these are going by what the, a furloin is equal to 660 feet and... Um, the cubit is 18 inches. It's usually from the tip of your hand to the elbow of a man. And it says by a man's measure, that is an angel. So uh, most likely it is the regular 18-inch uh, cubit that is listed here. So that's what it's like. And it says that each gate, it has 12 gates, three on each side. You would need at least three, wouldn't you? If you got a 1,400-mile gate, that's a long between gates on each side. But it's got its three gates on each side. Each gate is named for a, uh, one of the apostles or, or one of the 12 tribes uh, of Israel. And uh, each gate is a single pearl. We see that over in verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Now, I didn't look up what the largest pearl I ever found was, but I'm sure it's not as big as a city gate. If you've got a wall 1,400 miles high, you're going to have a pretty high gate in there. Even if it's just six foot high to get in, uh, that's a pretty good-sized pearl. 
and each one is a single pearl. And as he's talking about the dimensions here, th those were the general uh, dimensions of the general design. The dimensions are listed in verse 16. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is great as its breadth. And so it's a cube. It's as high and as long. And, and we see that down in a little bit further. He measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Length, breadth, and height are equal. <coughs> so it's uh, 1,400 miles any way around that you look at it. And it says, just to give you kind of a perspective here, some people say, well, I don't know if heaven's going to be big enough for everybody. I mean, if everybody in the world is saved, is heaven going to be big enough? Well, to give us some perspective, if the city of Jerusalem was laid out on earth, it would reach from Canada to Mexico, from the Appalachian Mountains to California. That's a pretty fair-sized city, don't you think? And with the walls 1,400 miles high, if each story was, let's say, 12 feet high, that's a pretty high building. That's, that's a pretty good height ceiling there. If every story was 12 feet high, heaven would contain 600,000 stories. I don't know about you, but if the elevator ever ran out, I don't think I'd want to live on the 600,000th floor. <laughs> That'd be a lot of steps to climb, wouldn't it? It'd be a good thing we're in our uh, eternal body that we can just, you know, transfer wherever we're going. But 600,000 stories. Now, I did a little bit more research, and um, the tallest building in the world is in Dubai. As a picture of it. I don't, can't pronounce the name of it, but it's in Dubai. And it only has 193 stories. It's a wee little building compared to what the New Jerusalem is going to be. It's going to be a pretty impressive place. And uh, I, I did do some uh, research. I'll, I'll give you this. It's not that uh, big a thing. The gates of pearl, the largest pearl ever found was 61 pounds, and it was only 15 inches. I think the pearl on the gate is going to be a lot bigger than that. God can do anything. God can do anything. So, that's the exterior. Pretty impressive, I would think, as you're approaching the city gates of the New Jerusalem. Well, what's the interior character going to be? We see uh, the um, general characteristics that are in the New Jerusalem. The streets... He says in, in verse 21, the streets are pure gold. The latter part of verse 21, the, city, the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. We pay a lot for gold down here, don't we? I always mention this when I stand at a graveside of someone who's passed away. To try to help the family to realize the place where they are. Now, this is the New Jerusalem. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but our loved ones that have gone on before may not be walking on streets of gold. It may be silver or brass. Or I don't know. I don't know what they're walking on exactly. This is the new Jerusalem. This is the new heaven and the new earth that comes after the millennium when all things become new. I know that where they are is with Jesus. Because Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's enough for me. Even if it was just dirt roads, and I don't think it's dirt roads where Jesus is, but to be with Jesus. So they're in a wonderful, special place. But this is the place that we're all going to be where the streets are made of pure gold and there are no potholes. Wouldn't it be great to go into a place where there are no potholes? <laughs> there wouldn't be any potholes in heaven made of pure gold. Now, there are some things that are not going to be in heaven, and we may as well get used to that right now. He says in verse 22, there's not going to be any temple in heaven. There's not going to be a church like this, not going to be a temple. Because God himself and the Lamb are the temple. Why do we need a temple? 
We come to church to worship God. It's not the only place we can worship. We can worship. I've worshiped in many places uh, rather than the church. Uh, I have had worship experiences when I've been on a boat, uh, just looking at the vastness of the ocean and thinking about the love of God or, or looking at some beautiful sunset or some beautiful view and thinking about the magnif- uh, magnificence of God and how the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth His handiwork. And, and I've worshipped, but church is a place that we come specifically designed for worship we don't come to be entertained we don't come uh, for fellowship uh, so much we come to fellowship with god we come to worship and we don't need a church like this because god's going to be right there and and we learned last week he's going to be with us our next door neighbor and so we can worship him at any time and so there's no need of a temple in that place also, in verse 23, the sun and the moon aren't going to shine anymore. And you say, oh, no, eternal night, I don't like night. No, the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine. Why? The glory of God illuminates it. What led the children of Israel through the wilderness? It was the Shekinah glory of God. In the daytime, when the sun was shining bright, it was a cloud that they could see easily. But at nighttime, when everything was dark, it was a pillow of fire that lit up the outside world around them. They could look out their tent door and they could see the presence of God in their midst. God's going to be there, and it says the Lamb is going to be the light. And if you look over in John's gospel when John was writing in John 8, 12, he said, Jesus said, I am the what? Light of the world. He is the light, and He's going to light the world. And all the nations who are saved, He says in verse 24, shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. So there's no moon or sun there because God is the light. Their gates, we've already talked about the gates of pearl, but in 25 it said, its gates shall not be shut. We're going to have gates in the city that are never shut. Now, I thought it was interesting when I went to Israel on one of the occasions I went, they were talking, I think it may have been the first time I went, about how important the city gates were and everybody lived inside the city. They would work perhaps outside the city in their fields and all, but at nighttime they came in and closed the gate. And the city of Jerusalem got to a place where it was just too crowded. They could not contain all the people that were living in the city of Jerusalem. And so the city fathers, the, the leaders, decided to develop and build apartment buildings just outside the city, walls. And they sold them to the residents at very little cost to them. And so they moved in by droves, and they filled those apartments. But guess what? When it got to be nighttime, they packed a little overnight bag, and they came back into the city because they felt safer. And they would live with family or loved ones or you know, a neighbor, friends or somebody that they had lived next to. And they would live in the city. And then in the morning, they'd go back to their apartment and they'd live and they'd work and they'd do whatever they have to do. But then the next night, they'd come with a little overnight bag and they would live in the city. And they continued to do that until it just got impossible to find places to live. And they were forced to move out and forced to realize that it was safe outside the city wall a little bit. But, you know, we live in a society today that it's not very safe to be outside the city walls. It's not safe to be in the city. But a lot of countries around the world, the people live behind gated communities. Every house has a little gate. It's not like a a gated community that we think of where you have one gate or one uh, security point and then all the rest of it is open. Every house has its own little gate because the people live in fear. But not when we get to heaven. It says there's not going to be any gates are not going to be shut at all at nighttime. Why? Because there's no nighttime. <laughs> it's perpetual day. Even though they don't have sun and, and uh, moon, uh, they're not going to have night there either. It, it's going to be really different for us. I, I remember going to Alaska a number of years ago to uh, work with a uh, former pastor here, Brother Greg Clark. 
And uh, I would get up and, uh, around 4 o'clock in the morning, maybe have to go to the bathroom somewhere, or I'd wake up. And I'd look outside, and it was d- just like dusk out there. It was bright enough that if I had wanted to, I could have gone out and cut grass. The sun wasn't shining bright, but it was bright enough for me to see how to get around and see anything that was going on. And that's the way it was all night. At whatever time you'd wake up in the night, that's as dark as it ever got in Juneau, Alaska, when we were there. There would be no more night. And finally, in verse 27, it says, There is going to be nothing that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie in heaven. We saw over in, chapter, in, in the same chapter in verse 8 that all idolaters and sorcerers and liars and Im- sexually immoral and murderers and all of those are going to be cast into the lake of fire. So there's nothing going to be allowed into the city of Jerusalem, into the new Jerusalem, except those whose names are written in the, Lamb books, the Lamb's book of life, like we talked about last week. So what is going to be there? If these things aren't going to be there, we know God is going to be there in Jesus. It says in verse 22, I didn't see a temple because God and the Lamb are the temple. They are there. So we know that God and Jesus are there. We know that those who are in the Lamb's book of life, we're going to be there. Because it says here, those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And it's going to be the most wonderful ecological environment that you can imagine. Everybody that's wanting to talk about the Green Deal and uh, green space and all kinds of stuff. uh, Now, that's going to be the real deal when we get to heaven. It's going to be a perfect place. Let's look down in verse 20, in chapter 22 for just a moment and kind of get a glimpse of what it's going to be. It's going to be a pure river, crystal clear. And I've been to Jamaica, and I, I fly in over Jamaica, and you can look down and see the bottom of the water, uh, the, the, the bottom down there, and what's in the water, you can see the fish. Crystal clear there in the Caribbean. Beautiful. Not like the Hall River. I had some people ask me if we baptize in the Hall River. I said, not on your life. (laughs) Maybe somebody in the past did, but I'm not getting in the Hall River uh, to baptize anybody. Um, It's going to be a pure water of life, crystal clear. It's going to have a tree of life. Remember, Adam rejected the tree of life in Genesis. He chose the the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But here, there's going to be a tree... In the middle of it, right on either side of the the river, and it's going to bear 12 fruit, a different fruit, every year, or every month. Every month it's going to have something different on there. And the leaves were for the healing of the nations. Not going to be any sickness, any problems, any difficulties. It's going to be a perfectly beautiful tree. And one of the greatest things in verse 3 of chapter 22 there's no more curse. Remember God cursed the earth in Genesis chapter 3? He cursed the earth. The new heaven, the new earth, not going to have any more curse. But God and, his, and the Lamb are going to be there, and we're going to serve Him. And the greatest thing, I think, about heaven is, in verse 4, we're going to see Him face to face. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their forehead. We'll have the ownership of God, and we'll see him face to face. Fanny Crosby wrote that song, Face to Face, I Shall Behold Him. Somebody asked her one time, how are you going to know when you see Jesus? You've never seen since you were a little child. How are you going to know? She said, I'll recognize him by the the nail prints in his hands. But she said, I'll see him face to face. And we will reign with him forever. So with that as a background, what do you think of heaven? Pretty nice place, don't you think? Pretty nice place to go to. And so we need to be making our reservation now. I think Jesus is calling us to make sure our reservation is secure. And I trust that all of us have. But he's wanting us to invite others and to help make others' reservations sure. 
There's nothing any worse than calling for a reservation when you go on vacation and traveling for a number of miles and getting there and finding they don't have your reservation. They don't have you listed. It was a wrong motel or you made the reservation at X and you're wanting to stay in Y and it's in the wrong place. That's a bad position to be in. But it happens. Jesus said, don't let that happen. I want you, I want the world to be saved. I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And heaven is big enough for everybody. He designed it with 600,000 stories, 1,400 miles wide, long, and high. There's plenty of room, and we're not going to be cramped with somebody living right up next to us that we have a little cubicle to stay in. We're going to have plenty of space to worship God forever. And He wants us to do all that we can to reach others for Him. Let's pray. Father, you have painted such a picture of heaven that I think most all of us long to be there. Oh, it's so much better than here. There's no sickness, no pain, no disappointments, no sorrows, no aging. We all know what it's like to have aches and pains and things that slow us down, they're not going to be there in heaven. You're going to be there, and we're going to see your face day in and day out. Just like the children of Israel could look out their tents and see the Shekinah glory, see your presence, whether it be in the form of a cloud or a pillar of fire, they could see your presence any time they looked up. We're going to be able to do that as well. And there's plenty of room for our family and our friends. In fact, we may get lost if we don't get busy and get family and friends and loved ones saved and introduce them to you so Holy Spirit can grab their hearts and lives and save them. Give us that passion, Father, that desire to tell other people about you. And, and this is the greatest time of year to do that. When people are talking about gift giving and buying stuff for other people, what greater opportunity do we have to say, well, I tell you, the greatest gift in the world is absolutely free. And that's the gift of eternal life. Have you made your purchase and accepted that gift today? Father, help us to be about your work, your business in these days. Keep us safe and dismiss us with your blessings and your watch care upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.